Bhavadai everyone. Today we're continuing our teaching series on the Church Unleashed and we're looking again at the end of chapter 2 in Acts and continuing with our Created for Community. Acts chapter 2 verses 30, 44 to 47 read as follows. All the believers were together and had everything in common Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now they talk about, let's start at the beginning. But I want to start at the end of this passage. As a county councillor, I attend various committee meetings and very often we have papers presented to us looking at various strategic plans. And we look at the way that resources and processes are put together to try and achieve certain outcomes. So what is the outcome that we have here at the end of this passage? Well, the outcome is simply this. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. What a fantastic picture. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the Lord was adding daily to Capel Galadi those who were becoming followers of Jesus? So how did the early church achieve this outcome? How did this come to happen? When we look at the passage, there are three core values that the early church was embracing which helped to bring about this wonderful outcome. And we're going to spend a little bit of time this morning looking at each of one of those core values. And the first one is this, the unity or oneness of those believers. In the few verses that I've just read, the word together is mentioned twice. The early believers really were a close-knit community. They had deep, intimate, positive relationships with each other. As you read through Paul's letters in the New Testament, he often talks about the way that believers carry out various functions one to another. And there's over... 30 verses where you can see that phrase, one another, one another, one another. And I won't go into the different verses now, but it talks about teaching one another, comforting one another, encouraging one another, forgiving one another, confessing to one another, restoring one another, loving one another. All these are pictures of the way in which we develop those close-knit relationships together because church unity matters church unity means that a community living in harmony together is a powerful witness to a watching world let me just repeat that again that we together living in harmony can be a powerful witness to a watching world in John chapter 17, verse 23, just after Jesus talks about praying for the believers, he says, May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. How does the world come to believe in Jesus? but partly by seeing the unity that is demonstrated within his church. The second core value that I want to touch upon is radical generosity. We see in this passage about how the early believers met the needs of those around them, and that is repeated again later in Acts chapter 4. And verse 32 onwards reads as follows. All the believers were one in heart and mind. There's that unity again. 
No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them. There were no needy persons among them. Isn't that a wonderful picture? There were no needy persons among them. Now, obviously, in the early church, it might have been a bit easier to have met the needs of the people around them because they, they literally lived in such close proximity to one another. Today, with the church being more scattered, it's not so easy. So how might this work in practice? Let me give an example. Let's imagine that a Larry is coming along to Capel Galadi. A Larry is a single mum with three small daughters. And one day her washing machine breaks down. So what can we do to help a Larry? Well, we might pray, saying, God, please help a Larry in her distress. Yes? Well, yes and no. It's fine to lift up a levy before God in prayer, but James teaches us that faith without works is dead. We actually need to do something to help a levy. Somebody might take some brownies round to her and just sit down with her for a pane de scus and just let her de-stress and get things off her chest. A more practical way of helping her would be if somebody has good, got good skills when it comes to fixing things and tries to mend a Larry's washing machine. Or it may be that somebody volunteers to do her washing until the washing machine can get fixed. Or it may be that somebody or some persons come together and get the money that's needed to buy a Larry a new washing machine and give her that gift either directly or indirectly. But somehow or other, we reach out to a levy and we meet her need. Does it make a difference if a levy has no connection with the church, that she isn't a member of Capel Galadi? Well, yes and no. This is what Paul says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. You see, there is a priority, a priority scale within the kingdom of God. If I could do a diagram, I'd do a diagram, but I'm not very good at doing diagrams uh, with technology. So if you imagine a circle... And in the middle of the circle is God. God is our number one priority. He must always come first. And then in the next circle is our family. Our commitment to our family comes next. And then the next circle would be the church. Afterwards, our commitment is to the church. And then the outside wider circle is the community. Everyone else outside of the church so it is good, it is right, that we seek to reach the needs of others outside of the church. And that's why we're involved in initiatives like, like Make Lunch, as we seek to meet the needs of poorer people all across the island. There's two more things I'd like to say about reaching out to those in need. The first relates to a podcast that I listened to recently about unplugging from social media and it really challenged me because what the person said was that when you go through posts on Twitter or Facebook which I do and you scroll down and you go not interested not interested not interested oh yes I'm interested in that what that person's got to say not interested not interested and that mindset of dismissing hosts of people that don't appeal to you can actually then take hold, take root of your general mindset when it comes to interacting with people. 
So then what may happen is that as you engage with people in and around the church, you might find yourself saying, I don't want to talk to that person. I'm not interested in that person. I'm not interested in that person. Oh, yes, I like that person. Oh, I'd like to try and help them. I'd like to spend time with them. That is not what God expects of us because God cares for each and every one of us equally. He has His love is towards each and every one of us. He doesn't say, not that person, not that person. And so we need to be careful that we have that same care and love for each and every one of us and that we don't pick and choose who we're interested in and who we're not. And the other thing I would say about meeting the needs of others is remember the words of Saint David, Dewi Sant, Gnelch a pethai bachan, do the small things. It doesn't have to be great things that we do in terms of meeting the needs of others. Sometimes they can be quite small. We have a new couple that have moved onto the estate where we live and they had to go and visit a poorly relative and they asked Liz if she could empty the bin for her, bins for them while they were away. No problem, Liz happily agreed to do that. Just a small thing but it's just helping to meet the needs of others. The third core value that we see here fully embraced by the early church is worship. Hands up if you like watching the Italian detective program Inspector Montal Montalblano. We enjoy watching the, the program. He, he has a love hate relationship with a pathologist, Dr. Pasquano. But one of the things that they share in common is a love of Sicilian food. And in the episode that Liz and I watched recently, halfway through the programme, during the middle of the investigation, Inspector Montalbano receives the tragic news that Dr. Pasquano has suddenly died. And there's a clip of them attending the funeral. And then afterwards, back at the police station, Monteblano calls his core team into his office. Doesn't say anything. And he has them just stand in front of his desk. And then there's a knock on the door. And the delivery person comes in with a tray and puts it on Inspector Monteblano's desk. And he unwraps the tray. And there on the tray is can cannoni, which is a Sicilian pastry that Dr. Pusquano loved to eat. And without saying anything, Montblano hands one of the pastries to each one of his team. And when they've all received the pastry, they begin to eat. Have a look at the photo. It's a very poignant moment. It's a special moment because it's a Eucharist moment. What they are doing as they are enjoying eating the cannoli is they are remembering their former colleague. And this is what the early disciples were doing as they broke bread together. Each time they would remember Jesus. We sing that chorus, that well-known chorus, Jesus Christ, I think upon your sacrifice. And at the end we say, once again I thank you, once again I pour out my life. Because as we break bread together and we remember Jesus and his sacrifice for us, it, is, it inspires us to worship him anew as we pour out our hearts to him, having remembered how he poured out his life to us. 
Because worship isn't just about singing songs, although it's good to sing and praise God. Worship is a lifestyle. Worship means that all that we do is for the glory of him as we continue to pour out our lives for him. Another program that Liz and I enjoy watching is Weatherman Walking with Derek Brockway, the Welsh weather presenter. And he walks around the Wales coastal footpath, looking at places of interest, talking to people who are interesting. And we, wa we watched an episode from his latest series the other week, and we suddenly noticed that the format of the programme has changed slightly. He's got two co-presenters with him who also do little contributions. And he's also invited people to send in their own small videos of places on the coastal footpath that mean something special to them. So the format has changed slightly, but the core of the programme remains the same. Namely, Derek walking around the coastal footpath of Wales. The way we do church today in the 21st century may have changed quite a bit from the way that church was done in New Testament times. But the core elements have to remain the same. Namely, that there is that strong church unity that there is that reaching out to make sure that those in need are helped, that there is that lifestyle of true worship unto God. Those things still have to be at the centre of church life and community. And to close, I'm just going to read those verses again, but I'm going to read them from the message this time. And all the believers lived in a wonderful harmony, holding everything in common. They sold whatever they owned and pooled their resources so that each person's needs was met. They followed a daily discipline of worship in the temple, followed by meals at home, every meal a celebration exuberant and joyful as they praised God. People in general liked what they saw. Every day their number grew as God added those who were saved. Lord, let it be in accordance with your word. Amen.